All right. Uh, thanks everyone for for joining us for the for the last episode of our patents and the public interest series. Uh, my name again is Charles Duan. I'm a fellow with the um, program on information justice and intellectual property with American University Washington College of Law, and I am delighted to be joined by my two friends and colleagues, uh, Matt Lane over at Insight. Public Affairs and Zane Rizvi, who's over at Public Citizen. Um, both of them have been working in the sort of patents and access to medicines and drug prices space for, for many years. And it's just been a real pr privilege to have worked with both of them. Um, so welcome, Matt and Zane. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Um, so I guess, um, you know, as you know, the series is um, talking about, um, you know, both kind of what's going on in the public interest space um, with regard to patent policy and also talking about, you know, Know what the space looks like as a career, um, and getting in, um, getting how you know how students can get into this area, and so you know I think that Matt and Zane both have very interesting experiences um, in this area. So you know, could you start off by just talking a little bit about um, the organization that you work at, um, where patent policy kind of fits in, particularly with the the sort of access to medicines and um, and, and uh, drug prices issues that you work on. I guess Zane, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so thanks again, Charles, for, for the invitation, and, and so glad to be with you all. Um, so I work at Public Citizen. Public Citizen is a consumer advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C. We work you know, across a range of issue areas, um, the environment, uh, campaign finance reform, uh, you know, medical device and drug regulation. Um, and I am based in the Access to Medicines team. Um, and so the Access to Medicines team has its kind of, kind of um, origin story and actually the HIV AIDS crisis um, and the work that went on to make sure that affordable generic HIV treatments were available uh, to people all around the world. There was this kind of long uh, history um, of uh, activists and uh, working around the world uh, to make sure that patents and IP bar barriers did not uh, pose a barrier to access. Um, and so now the Access to Medicines team, uh, I, my title is Research Director. Um, you know, I am one member of the team. I think there is one, two, three, four, five of us now. Um, and the Access to Medicines team works both on domestic policy issues and global policy issues. Um, we focus on uh, in the U.S. on drug pricing, and particularly uh, looking at executive actions, including you know some patent-based authorities to increase access to medicines. Uh, on the global side, we've done a lot of work on providing technical assistance to governments that are reforming um, their patent policies uh, and their patent laws. Uh, we've done some work on some work. We've done a lot of work on COVID-19, on increasing access to vaccines and therapeutics. Uh, and thinking about both patents, but also trade secrets, uh, which are you know, increasing a increasingly a barrier uh, to medicine production. Um, and most recently, uh, you know, we have done some work looking at uh, monkeypox uh, and the, the available tools that are, are, uh, uh, can be used in the response. Um, and so the role um, you know, can vary quite substantially uh, day to day. Um, but I think uh, I, you know, am, am grateful for the opportunity to have this role and, and to be able to work on these uh, important issues. And I'll pass it to Matt. Thanks. And, and thanks so much, Charles, for having us. Uh, I'm Matt Lane. I'm with Inside Public Affairs. We're a small uh, public affairs firm with a public interest focus and uh, by choice. And uh, as part of that, I do a lot of work in uh, intellectual property across the board, um, tech governance and internet governance issues, increasingly some human rights stuff. But I would say, you know, my core area of expertise and what I've worked the longest in is um, the uh, intersection of competition policy and intellectual property policy. And as part of that, I'm executive director of the Coalition Against Patent Abuse, which is an informal coalition of various mm -hmm. stakeholders, both nonprofits and some for-profit entities who are very concerned about rising drug prices that are really tied to certain patent practices um, that is becoming increasingly popular among 
a lot of big branding firms um, that we think is, you know, anti-competitive and harmful and obviously leads to higher drug prices because once generics come to market, uh, prices drop by average about 80%. It's a huge amount of savings to consumers. And when companies engage in practices that prevent that competition from entering, um, that keeps the prices high and, and hurts a lot of patients. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that's why Charles invited me to discuss on this particular panel. Um, it's it's pretty good work. It's interesting, and um, you know, uh, hopefully, we'll get some wins soon there. Yeah, and you know, there are definitely a lot of issues, um, kind of in this, um, in the in the patents and pharmaceutical space, um, that are going on going on right now. You know, about COVID vaccines, um, you know, this question about waiving um IP rights in um in in the international context, um, and then you know, just generally with the the issue of just high drug prices in the United States, and you know, how do patents impact that? And you know what's the you know what what are some appropriate solutions? How how can how does the government fit in? How do things like march and rights fit in? Uh, so you know I'd love to hear about you know some of the some of the particular things that you've been doing in this in this space. If there are any particular issues that um, have you know that you've been keeping track of or that you've been working on especially intensely, I think you know it it'd be it'd be great to hear about that. Um, I can start. Um, so I think. Uh... Let me give some of the, the problem statement as we understand it, right? Which is that um, we have seen both during the pandemic, but pr also prior to the pandemic, the, the significant negative consequences associated with monopoly control. Um, and the monopoly control that we're talking about is uh, the ability of pharmaceutical corporations to kind of wield enormous power over decisions about pricing, about production. Um, so it includes questions about who gets medicines, uh, at what price, when do they get medicines, where are those medicines produced? Um, and those questions are actually rooted in IP policy, right? The, because we know uh, that medicines are you know, and Matt Lane has already discussed this statistic, um, but medicines are different, right? Medicines are what makes medicines expensive, for example, is not the fact that they're, you know, really expensive to produce. It's not necessarily the research and development cost, uh, but it's the ability of these corporations to charge uh, what the market uh, will bear. Um, and so you are seeing these kind of extractive practices across the industry, I would say, and then there's these egregious examples that kind of surface. Um, and in recent years, the examples have surfaced more and more frequently, pointing to the need for significant, significant reform. So when we think about insulin, for example, and the idea that, you know, what a company was charging in 1996 was around $21, or I think, yeah, I think it was $21 in 1996. Um, you know, uh, same company is now charging close to $300 for the exact same product. Um, and so there's, you know, many reasons that go into that uh, kind of egregious situation, but IP policy and patent policy in particular have uh, some role in influencing those outcomes. Um, and so, you know, with that lens, with that um, kind of perspective, we've been engaging both on domestic drug pricing issues and global access to medicines issues. And so in terms of, you know, what I'm thinking about now and what I'm working on, uh, most recently, I, you know, literally yesterday, we put out a report looking at monkeypox vaccine production. And so this is actually a fascinating story uh, about how uh, the US government and German government actually for decades have been helping develop this vaccine uh, initially for smallpox purposes. Um, and then it was repurposed for monkeypox um, and, and finally got approval. And so the US government, you know, provided nearly $2 billion in support. Um, and yet when it came to the outbreak itself, that single company retained the authority to make all those key critical deci decisions, right? Who gets access to the vaccine? When do they get access to the vaccine? Where is the vaccine produced? How much uh, does the vaccine cost? Um, and so there's a kind of theme in my work, at least about what the role of the public sector should be, whether it's just kind of 
you know, yet another venture capitalist that is just, you know, putting in money. And that's actually, that's not even, it's a, it's, it's like a, a stupid venture capitalist, right? It's a venture capitalist that gives money, but then also does not retain any ownership or any rights. So it's kind of, you know, should we continue that model or should we have uh, a model in which the government is actually, you know, uh, co-creating and, and, and shaping uh, how the products are produced and, 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 and manufactured and, and delivered? Um, so that is one example of, 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 of a project that I've been working on. On the domestic side, one of our key focuses has been around executive action on drug prices. Um, and so, you know, many of you, are, of course, are IP students, so you understand this, but IP rights are not God given, right? Despite what, you know, John Locke might tell you, right? And IP rights are, are government granted monopolies. Um, and so when the government grants these monopolies, uh, the government also retains the right to be able to use patented inventions uh, in exchange for reasonable compensation. And this is a statute actually, I think Charles has written about as well. Uh, and you know, we've done a lot of work on, it's called section 1498. And so section 1498 has its history, you know, it's goes back, you know, to 1900s. Um, and we have been thinking about how section 1498 could be used uh, to introduce generic competition and to make medicines affordable in the US, um, you know, with the stroke of a pen, uh, essentially. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll pass it to Matt. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I work in public affairs. And so what we really do is we're an advocate for whatever um, cause um, is our client. And in this case, our clients, um, you know, are a representative of what we believe is a public interest. And so um, we really um, work towards building consensus, promoting good policy ideas, acting as a funnel from academia to um, inside the beltway, to policymakers, to staffers, uh, making sure they have the best information, um, you know, making sure that other folks in the community are aware of the information. I think in IP policy, it's, it's interesting in that um, it's very complicated, and I think it might be intentionally complicated. I mean, it makes, uh, you know, the patent bar and other folks a lot of money to sort through the complication. Um, it doesn't, in my opinion, necessarily need to be that complicated, but because of the complication, people are scared of it, and then they don't engage. And so finding ways to simplify the ideas, finding ways to get back to basics of the intention of the IP system, the um, United States is sort of always followed this um, uh, public bargain trend idea of IP and that it's meant to be a reward in exchange for sharing the ideas, for teaching people how to do the things and make the stuff. And then you get a temporary monopoly as payment for that. Um, I think that idea is pretty simple. Um, and, you know, from that, I think that we're really kind of uh, gone off the beaten track and we're in this sort of weird area. Um, Professor Rachel Sachs recently wrote a paper saying the accidental innovation, uh, I'm, I'm getting this paper name really wrong. Uh, hold on, I have it pulled up. It's uh, the accidental innovation policymakers. And I think that like it rings really true to me as someone who's worked in this space. Um, and so a lot of the incentive structure and the innovation design uh, as far as incentives is kind of been largely accidental in the drug space for a while. And the drug companies have been permitted to basically uh, come up with their own systems, um, you know, increasing patent lengths through patent tickets and, and other things that have been quite successful. And so um, I'm really working on trying to bring more thought into actually constructing these policies deliberately and sort of more evidence-based. Um, in the short term, you know, there's um, some bills that are designed to help increase patent quality and cut through some thickets with some low quality patents protecting these drugs. In the long term, I'm really working on trying to figure out how to elevate the conversation and build it more around um, 
how do we build a good incentive system, a good innovation system that both rewards um, new discoveries and, and promotes those sort of uh, progress of, of, of those discoveries, but also, um, you know, fairly pays for them. And we pay for them in a number of ways, including very direct government subsidies and public research, and also just like as American citizens, every time we pay a patent price for a drug, we're paying a lot of extra money as a price of that innovation. So we need to make sure we're getting um, good value for that and not overpaying. And so that's that's um, a big part of the conversation. We can follow up on that, but there's some interesting conversations I've had with some experts that I think would be really great to, to build out and uh, really sort of direct some policy discussions going forward. Yeah, it's interesting. So both of you mentioned um, the the sort of the sort of oddity, which I think is um, especially um, notable in the in the pharmaceutical space of you know the government paid for a lot of this research, and so taxpayers and citizens effectively paid for a lot of this research, and yet there doesn't seem to be sort of control over those rights once um, you know they they show up as products and um, often and when when they show up as patented products that now become potentially inaccessible to the same taxpayers who, who paid for them. Uh, what are the sorts of tools that we're looking at to, to try to to try to deal with this? Uh, Zane, you mentioned uh, Section 1498, and you know, I know that there are, there are a couple of others, but I think it would be great if um, you, know, you could give, give folks kind of an overview of what those look like and kind of what the, what the opportunities in the policy space look like right now. Sure. So um, the US National Institutes of Health is the largest biomedical R&D funder in the world. Right, so the NIH alone spends forty-one billion dollars a year, forty-one billion with a B, on biomedical research, um, and the scope and extent of the research varies. Sometimes it's you know uh, very upstream, very basic. Sometimes it's deeper. Sometimes it's you know in clinical trials and and more in product development. But one way to understand it is that you know much, if not all, of biomedical kind of advances are are resting on this kind of uh, base of knowledge, right? What we understand about diseases, what we understand about targets, what we understand about, um, in some cases, potentially even drug candidates and, 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 and compounds. Um, and so you have this kind of giant, right? Which is the NIH um, and the federal government, um, there's a couple of different strategies the government could use uh, to assert its right. One is actually contractual, right? So the US government, enters into these deals with small biotechs or pharmaceutical corporations, these licensing agreements. Um, and in those, the, those agreements themselves, the US government could flex uh, a little bit more power. And so for example, in the 90s, the NIH introduced a reasonable pricing clause, which was the idea that if you're using this taxpayer publicly funded technology, then you have to make sure that the prices are reasonable to US taxpayers. Um, unfortunately, you know, the pharmaceutical industry fought back, they were able to kind of successfully remove those clauses. Um, but the idea of uh, contractually kind of generating public interest obligations, you know, I think is a powerful one. And you could think about it uh, actually in three ways. One is contractual obligations relating to price, because we know price is obviously a significant barrier. Um, in the case of, you know, medical countermeasures that are used in emergency situations, you could think about it in terms of supply. So there's some allocation for global access needs. And then finally, three, you could think about it in terms of uh, technology transfer and IP. And so when we are sharing some of, you know, the public is sharing some public IP, then the pharmaceutical, you know, recipient uh, can be obliged to share some of their IP, uh, you know, for global access purposes. Uh, so that's one set of tools. The other set of tools um, are actually uh, uh, based in, in, in statute. Uh, and so the Bayh-Dole Act, for example, requires, uh, you know, in some cases, uh, when the U.S. government enters into these deals, when there are, is um, this licensing occurring, that the U.S. government retains some of these rights. Um, they are colloquially, colloquially called margin rights. Um, and sometimes, you know, as in many other areas of IP policy, sometimes their application and their the specific terminology gets conflated with other sets of rights, including Section 1498. But margin rights are kind of a distinct set of rights. Um, and the idea is that the government 
can introduce additional, you know, producers can license those rights or can require the, the company to license those rights as well and right, license the rights themselves um, uh, when specific triggers are met. And, you know, there are enumerated triggers in the statute um, and there's been kind of a decade long uh, intellectual battle over whether, you know, Martian rights contemplate things like uh, reasonable pricing, uh, because, you know, one of the triggers is defined as, this is getting very wonky, but practical application, practical application is defined as, you know, as being available on reasonable terms, what is available on reasonable terms mean. Um, and so that's kind of one of the other the main tools uh, that the federal government can do. It's important to, to realize that Martin rights apply to specific technology, specific inventions that were developed with federal funding. Uh, um, and so it's a different kind of set of rights uh, than would apply, uh, you know, if it was not a federally funded or federally uh, uh, developed product. Yeah, I, th I think that Zane has really gone over a lot of the the really good tools to deal with these problems after the fact. And I know that both Zane and Charles have written a lot, done a lot of good work here. Um, one of the things I've really been interested in exploring lately and I'm in the early stages of trying to build out this conversation and maybe hold a panel, but um, is the things that we could do beforehand. And, and I think that the pandemic has really opened my eyes to the fact that there's almost an addiction to patents as the sole innovation policy. And it doesn't really work that great for a lot of drug products. Um, as we saw with vaccines, you know, here's a product in which if it sells really well, it's because there's been a breakdown in global health policy, which we experienced. Um, and if everything goes right, that product is not going to be sold for the poor, full like 14, 15, 16 years. I think most drugs have an exclusivity on the market. Uh, if everything goes right, hopefully they're only gonna be selling it for a year or two. Um, and so, you know, there's not a ton of incentive um, just based on patents to invest in vaccines. And so what the government did, which I think was probably pretty smart, was they said, you know, we're going to throw every incentive that we can think of at, at this problem. And so um, they invest a lot in public funding, open science. Um, they had a lot of um, sort of public-private partnerships there with, with basic uh, discovery of what the disease is, targets, ways to develop these you know, mRNA platforms into vaccines for it. Um, there was also guaranteed purchase orders by a lot of governments. Um, there's continued large purchase orders. Um, so in the beginning of the pandemic, I don't know if folks remember, but they said any vaccine that meets these you know, requirements, we're gonna put out a big order for. And so that, that gets rid of a lot of risk for these drug companies. And then to this day, the government is still applying a lot of these things and not really necessarily leaving it up to the public to, to purchase them, which is unfortunately um, maybe a, a good thing because the current usage of boosters is quite low. Um, but um, you know, these are all incentives and they get to be deployed elsewhere. Now, one of the things that's a little unfortunate is we still throw patents on the mix. Like we still give them, you know, all these patent rights and everything on top of that. And maybe in this, you know, emergency that, you know, that was warranted, um, I'm not sure about that, but I think we could use this event as a lesson in ways to develop alternative incentives that could coexist alongside patents, sometimes be alternatives for patents. Um, I had a really interesting conversation with someone who was working on open science practices for the development of antibiotics, which is another area in which there's historically been poor investment. Um, no matter what patent rights we give drug companies, it's a similar situation. You know, you don't want doctors prescribing antibiotics if a patient doesn't need it. Um, you'd rather, you know, them not have to be in a situation in which they need antibiotics. And so it's not necessarily a great product to invest a lot of money into um, for those reasons. And so, um, you know, there has to be alternative incentives, I think, in some of these areas. And so I'd like to see more 
thoughtful policy development and sort of reconceptualize what is innovation policy? How do we deliberately, um, you know, build these systems and, you know, how do we get the most for the public interest? In addition to obviously, you know, profit motive is always going to be important. So that it needs to be balanced. Yeah, so it, it's really interesting, Matt, that you kind of identify the, the sort of narrative issue, right? You know, just how do we talk about patents? How do we talk about um, innovation, you know, particularly in the pharmaceutical space, but also um, also more generally? And, you know, kind of what does what is the role of that conversation um, in assessing and pushing forward some of the policy questions that you've talked about. Um, I think that's actually a great transition. Um, as you know, you know, I think we like to talk about kind of what your careers look like and what jobs in the public interest uh, patent policy space look, look like. Um, I'd like to invite any of the folks, particularly students who are interested in going into this space, um, to, to ask questions. You can do that by either using the raise hands feature in Zoom or feel free to just put them into the chat and uh, we'll, we'll bring them up in conversation. But I guess, you know, just to start off with, um, you know, piggybacking off of that conversation, how do you build those sorts of narratives? How do you, um, you know, how do you push forward these sorts of stories that, um, that, that kind of counter the, the sort of messaging that, that you've otherwise heard um, in your capacities as, um, as nonprofit advocates or as advocates on, on policy issues? Um, I go first for a change. <laughs> I, um, I found that the easiest way to do it is to try to step back and get back to basics. Because I think the basics of how the United States patent system um, was created is, is pretty simple. And, um, you know, there's lots of interesting writings. I, I love this Thomas Jefferson letter that's uh, in the archives um, that has caused so much controversy that there was an entire law review paper that's titled, Who Cares What Thomas Jefferson Thinks About Patents? So, um, but, you know, I, they, they very much thought of, like, this is a tool to promote innovation and <clears throat> to really give the public the access to this information. And I know that a lot of times, um, you know, they say, we need strong patents, otherwise everyone's going to keep trade secrets. Well, unfortunately, a drug system today, we have lots of drugs that are protected by tens, you know, of patents or more, sometimes over 100, and they're still also protected by trade secret. So a generic that wanted to come on the market would still have to do quite a bit of work to, you know, reverse engineer this product. In addition to the fact that they also have to potentially defeat a bunch of patents and other things. And so that's, that's not really, in my opinion, a functioning system. And so when you, when you get back to basics and you sort of try to say, look, this is an intentional system that was built in order to balance the public interest against, um, you know, the, the need to reward innovation. And that getting that, that balance right um, gives a lot of value to, to everyone. Um, and we also see a situation in which, like, when you give too much patent rights, it doesn't always give you more innovation. Obviously, the amount of innovation you get per strength of patent right goes down over time, but it actually goes backwards because, you know, especially in the drug industry, once you have a blockbuster, like most drug companies think they have a blockbuster and it just doesn't sell well. And then sometimes you like stumble upon something that, that just sells enormously well. And, and um, but once you, you've identified that, the easiest thing to do is to protect it with more rights. Uh, not to go and find another one, which is very, you know, time consuming and, and can be expensive. Um, and so, you know, the stronger pad rights and the ability to layer on these, these um, pad rights on drugs that are in the market, like them to, to spend your resources in doing that and not sort of developing these new products in the, in the pipeline or, you know, tweaking these blockbusters and making subtle variations that don't really drive a ton of consumer value. And also, you know, sometimes they'd like, they've been accused of sitting on innovation. Um, I know Zane knows way more about this case than I do, but the Gilead HIV case, they were accused of basically sitting on a safer version of the drug because they still had some patent life in the current very well-selling drug. And so they didn't want to, they wanted to basically time them so that they could get the maximum total number of years of, of monopoly protection. So you know, these things are all problematic when we're thinking about, you know, getting, you know, good 
innovation in exchange for these monopoly rights? Yeah, I think the one thing I, I, I'd add also is that like, I think part of my work and it's because it's sort of research heavy is just looking at the facts, right? And sometimes it's hard to kind of distill the facts because there's this huge asymmetry of information, which I can talk about a little bit later. Um, but I think part of the, the kind of narrative challenge has to be addressed by creating not just a kind of a negative story about how harmful the current monopoly model is for access to medicines, but also lifting up the positive story, right? Which is the, the story of the public sector, of how the government does this incredible transformative work um, and yet one takes so little credit for it and then two does so little to ensure kind of access right and there's there's a kind of a history of this in a sense too when you think about you know DARPA which is housed you know uh, within the, the Department of Defense that does this kind of cool innovative new research um, you know DARPA one of DARPA's greatest successes is going to be seen, for example, as mRNA technology. But how many people know that DARPA played a key role in facilitating the development of mRNA technology, right? Um, and so part of the, 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 the work that I do is kind of lift up these stories. Um, you know, I wrote a piece, for example, and going back to it on monkeypox and how the vaccine was the, this product of uh, immense pioneering public sector contributions um, and how, you know, a, a, a Danish, a small Danish company now largely controls um, uh, how it is uh, produced and distributed. So that's one part of the, the story. The difficulty in, 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 in saying this part of the story, of course, is this asymmetry of information that I talked about earlier. And so as, you know, public sector advocates, we have access to certain tools and certain pieces of information, right? I sort of, you know, look in very tedious places that most people don't look, including financial filings, patent applications, patents. And I'm trying to kind of gather facts and kind of assemble evidence about, uh, you know, what, uh, what is going on. Uh, but of course, there is kind of this enormous wealth of information that the private corporations themselves hold, or in some cases, the government holds, um, but it is considered kind of proprietary and you know off off limits. Uh, and so I'm talking here about things like clinical trial costs. I'm talking here about research and development costs. Um, and so I think that um, you know one of the challenges of working in this space is that you are operating um, you know with with less information uh, than some others. And so you have to be able to kind of, make use of what information is available out there to make the most compelling arguments uh, and be willing to acknowledge the limits of what you don't know. Um, but the reality is, the, the, you know, the, what we do know is, is, is so clear and is so uh, egregious uh, that the, 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 the need for reform and action could not be more obvious. Yeah, so I mean that that that's actually a really interesting point that I had I hadn't thought about. Just the the access to information um, is difficult, and so kind of working on these issues as an outsider is um, is, is certainly a challenge. Uh, Sharon, you've got a question. Do you want to go ahead? Uh, I think you're still muted. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so my question is to Zen. Uh, actually, I wanted to know about the um, the margin rights. What you have just mentioned is very much like similar in India. We have compulsory licensing uh, provisions uh, similar to the margin rights, and like we have a uh, good compulsory licensing or licensing provisions in Patents Act, but they are very sparsely used because of intense lobbying for pharmaceuticals and also political pressure. So, so far in the history, like in Indian history of Patents Act, only we have one compulsory license from 2012, and uh, uh, I would like to know what's the scenario in the US regarding this, like uh, how how and what exactly, besides the pricing of the medicine, what exactly triggers the marching rights in the US and also the uh, political and- Sure, sure, yeah, issue. that's a great question. So I would answer it by actually taking a step back. So I think there are, you could consider, I guess, there are 
two compulsory licensing statutes in the US, right? So one is the kind of the margin rights and that applies to federally funded inventions. Um, and then there is the broader section 1498. Um, margin, margin rights, uh, you know, have been uh, used far less than actual section 1498. So section 1498 is this broad government statute that's actually used all the time in different sectors. Um, and so, you know, there's kind of a rich case law detailing how, for example, when the Department of Defense wants to buy night vision goggles, it sometimes can procure those goggles from people who don't hold patents and then just pay reasonable compensation uh, to the patent holder. Uh, interestingly, the, um, the, the statute section 1498 actually had been used in the 1960s for pharmaceuticals as well. Um, you know, there's some case law, or not even case law, but there's some uh, there's some history uh, around how you know the U.S. government wanted to buy an antibiotic. The I think it was Pfizer at the time was charging too much, and so the company, uh, so the U.S. government rather went to uh, another purchaser based in or another producer and based in Italy and and bought the the antibiotic from them instead. Um, so there is that kind of uh, you know historical precedent. Um, and there's also precedent in other fields. One really interesting precedent um, that colleagues of ours at Knowledge, and, Knowledge Ecology International have, have kind of uh, uh, recently documented is how Section 1498 is actually used contractually as well. Uh, and so in a lot of the COVID-19 vaccine contracts, you know, that Matt was talking about, the U.S. government gave, you know, Moderna, you know, 483 million in April 2020, right? And they kind of kept giving them money uh, throughout the process. Um, but they didn't just give money. They also kind of de-risked the process in some sense as well. So within uh, the vaccine contract with Moderna, the U.S. government also authorized Moderna uh, under these federal acquisition regulations to use, uh, to be able to use patents. Um, and so the government uh, basically indemnified Moderna on that respect. And it's really interesting because Moderna itself then ended up getting sued, you know, by some other third party, which said, you know, you are infringing on our patent. And Moderna raised the defense of Section 1498 and said, look, we understand that, you know, there's a kind of, you know, long tradition in U.S. patent law history that every patent has its limits, you know, and the limit is Section 1498. And so it's actually really incredible uh, having worked in the space for, I don't know, five, six years now, advocating for the use of Section 1498 to see this pharmaceutical company kind of champion its benefits, you know, and talk about how powerful it is. Uh, so there is that kind of use of Section 1498. I think the big question, you know, and the remaining question will be, uh, you know, will the U.S. government use Section 1498 or margin rights, for example, to increase medicine access um, by introducing additional competitors, right? That's sort of the, the use case that we're still um, waiting on the U.S. government to deploy fully. You know, it's, it's threatened it a little bit, you know, in, in 2001, for example, um, during the anthrax scare, Secretary Tommy Thompson uh, talked about Section 1498 a little bit, um, and that, you know, led to some positive uh, developments. Um, but in recent history, the U.S. has not formally exercised Section 1498 or margin rights uh, to increase medicine access uh, and introduce generic uh, competitors yet. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a uh, the the use of Section 1498 is a is a super fascinating um, sort of just historically, but also in terms of what what, what potential it has. Um, and so, so, so yeah, you know, I know, I know that there's sort of a, there, there's, um, certainly a lot of, a lot of ongoing debate, um, as to, as to where that fits in, in terms of the, the current drug pricing debates, um, and access to vaccines and such. Um, kind of returning to, um, to the, to the talk we were discussing previously, 
um, you know, we mentioned, you know, some of these really interesting, um, interesting stories, like, and you were talking about, um, this, like, the, the role of DARPA in funding mRNA technology that people don't really know about. Um, how do you get that sort of information out, right? Because, you know, once you're kind of sitting on that, you know, you write the report, but then how do you, like, make that public? I know that public citizen is actually really fantastic, and Matt, and I know this is kind of a big part of your work as well. Um, the, the, the sort of role of getting information out there, especially in front of policymakers, like how do how do you achieve that? Um, I, I can I can start. I know Matt will have lots to say as well. Um, so I think where I sit, um, part of it is telling the story in a way that is interesting, right? And it's a it's a way of of ma of, of capturing people's attention. And so, for example, during the COVID pandemic. You know, of course, there was a lot of kind of news interest and a lot of media interest in COVID nineteen stories, um, and so I think you know we did a we did a lot of work actually with journalists, with other kind of public outlets to kind of document these stories together um, and to uh, lift up uh, these narratives. And so one example I can give here is, uh, for example, you know I really did a lot of work around Moderna. And so I, you know, reviewed financial filings or reviewed patent applications, and it just so happened in one of the, you know, if you think reviewing patents is kind of a laborious task, so let me tell you about reviewing patent applications, right? It's like a step above. Um, but anyway, so I was reviewing it, you know, it's kind of, if you look where no one's looking, you can find what no one has found kind of thing. Um, and so I was looking in these patent applications and I saw this one line that kind of really, you know, struck out is stuck out to me because I thought I was like oh wow this is you know this is outrageous which was that uh, we had known that the NIH and Moderna were working together on the vaccine in this patent application Moderna disclosed you know it just kind of some random document and they, they disclosed that the NIH had requested to be a co-inventor uh, on the vet on this patent on this vaccine patent and but in Moderna you know had made a good faith determination that the NIH, you know, was not a co-inventor. So that obviously was a dispute, uh, you know, I, and I shared it with some journalists and, you know, the journalists kind of ran with it and were able to kind of document the, the story and the context about what this patent dispute was. And it was a crazy time, right? Like, can you imagine, you know, Charles or Matt, if, you know, vaccine patent issues are the front page of the New York Times, right? Like that was, I think, partly like an artifact of kind of, the time that we were living in with the pandemic. And so obviously the job has gotten harder about kind of capturing public attention and, and shaping the narrative. Um, but there's a lot of important work to be done now, right? Because we think about, well, what went wrong with the pandemic and how do we kind of, how do we do things better? Um, and so, you know, I am one person, you know, I'm part of a larger team at, at Public Citizen and we have folks who do a lot more, um, uh, advocacy and, and work with, uh, you know, members of Congress and, and, and do a lot of Hill work. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll transition to Matt. Yeah, I think that, like, our story is similar to Zane's. Um, you know, I, my undergrad was journalism and finance, and somehow I, I used the knowledge sets of both quite frequently, but um, you know, always keeping in mind what's timely, what's interesting, what's good information, um, building relationships with journalists. I try to, um, you know, with the journalists I talk to, let them know that if I'm not the right person to ask questions doing something, I'll find that person for them, um, you know, which is something that I think is really important. Um, uh, making sure they have good information, um, you know, sometimes just writing the op-ed or the, the article yourself, if it's important and you get the story right. Um, and, and also it just, you know, directly reaching out to policymakers. I think um, a lot of TV shows and, and sort of maybe news reporting has given lobbying this, this very sinister um, uh, perspective, but you know, I know a lot of public interest lobbyists, I do public interest lobbying, and a lot of times it's actually just reaching out to the folks working on this and saying, hey, do you know about this information? Can I um, have some of your time to talk through it? Um, do you know, if you need resources, let me know. If you need to be connected to any of the experts, let me know. I also try to keep a good 
a lot of communication to um, people working on these things um, and help sort of circulate their papers on the Hill, help them engage with um, DC, um, you know, something that we've, we've just been helpful because it could produces good policy is to just, you know, try to figure out a way to get staffers in a room with a professor who's working on an issue that directly impacts um, how policy is being written. Um, so they can ask questions, um, so stuff like that. Yeah, that actually reminds me, one, one thing I also say, and this is something I learned in an international context, but I remember speaking with a policymaker and they were kind of appreciative of the way that we had packaged information and brought it to them. And, you know, they, they said something I don't think I'll ever forget, which was that like, you know, when you're a policymaker, it's, <laughs> you're trying to drink water out of a fire hose, right? And so there's this kind of massive amount of information that's coming at you at all times. Um, and so it's really hard to be able to be, you know, to, 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 to make sense of that information, to act on that information, to prioritize that information, to kind of understand what it means. Um, and so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work to be done to kind of um, not just generate new things, but also the new things can help, you know, generate media interest, but sometimes the real work is just talking about the old things in the right way and talking about them over and over and over again uh, until you make some progress there. And again, this actually goes back to some of my comments about asymmetries, right? And so in the public interest, I talked about some of the asymmetry of information. There's also an asymmetry of resources, right? If you think about access to medicines issues, uh, and in the US, you know, from a patent perspective, I think Matt or I could list maybe 20 people who are working on this, right? And that's generous. 20 people is a lot, like maybe, maybe 12, right? Um, and that is not the case from a private industry perspective, right? Like that, that is, you know, probably one company has like a dozen lobbyists, right? Or a dozen kind of advocates or a dozen researchers, right? Um, and so there is this kind of intense asymmetry built into the system that way as well, um, because um, it's it, it, it's yeah it's it's challenging to work in that environment. Um, and so maybe I'll make my pitch here, which is that if you are interested in public interest careers, there is a real need, right? There is a real need for more folks, um, especially in these areas, right? Because I think a lot of People who are interested in public interest often think of public interest as it relates to um, what's the right way to put this, but like other other fields of law, right? When you you there is sort of a a career path in public interest when you think about being a public defender, for example, right? Or when you think about you know doing uh, immigration work, um, there are sort of well defined kind of career paths when it comes to public interest in that sense. And so I think Charles, what you're doing, you know, with this series is really great is showing how there's actually a public interest, even in these fields that are often dominated by private interests, um, right? And in some ways, the public interest work is actually more urgent because, you know, let's face it, these fields are kind of complicated and wonky and they, they require, um, you know, they require some investment, uh, to to kind of get you know to get your foot in the door, uh, but once you do, I think you know there are tremendous opportunities out there, uh, and you know more importantly, there is tremendous need for public interest, public minded uh, people, so that you know these kind of complex technical areas are not just left to industry, right, or industry lawyers or or or, or, or folks. Uh, you know, more aligned with private interests. Yeah, that, that's such a great statement of, you know, kind of what the series is about, but also just, you know, why why this career is so important. You know, you, we need somebody who's going to go through all those patent applications and discover that one line about NIH and Moderna. So, um, you know, I think it's fantastic that, um, that that you're doing that. And it's it, it certainly is a great opportunity for, for other folks. Um, Matt, I did, I, I don't know if you had, wanted to add something there. Yeah, I just want to pick up on a point that, Zam is making, I think is really important, is that I've heard stories of um, some industry lobbyists going into offices and saying, this is all very complicated and you're not gonna be able to understand it. So just trust me when I say, this is what we need to do. And that really annoys me 
because I think that um, you know these things are important and we shouldn't be like undermining the intelligence of staffers. Like there's a lot of background basic knowledge they need to understand some of the more arcane details. But I think as a policy matter, there's a lot of on ramps for understanding this stuff. And I think that a big part of our job, Nate and I, is finding the on ramps to like be like, oh, like that's how this is working now. And, and here's how it work more ideally. And, and it's not like it is in, in a lot of ways combative, like us versus industry, but also it's just, it's not like we are trying to make industry make no money. It's we're trying to prevent them from making the extra money that, you know, that in a sort of better aligned system they wouldn't be making. And so it's, you know, in, in sort of competition terms, it'd be like monopoly rents, you know, the little, the little access you get from engaging in behavior that is probably best discouraged. And, and you know, making sure industries are still fully functional, operative, and, and have all the right incentives in place is still important to, I think, both Dane and I. But like, there's just a lot of behavior that's going on um, because it makes a lot of money that, you know, is probably best discouraged and doesn't really benefit the public interest very much at all. So I guess last question for both of you. Um, you both have great jobs. How would I get one like that? Um, so I think, you know, when I was in law school, I really benefited from working with you know, groups and professors who are interested and involved in the field. Um, and that, of course, you know, the, the relationships you build, um, I think, can be really helpful in kind of uh, setting you up uh, to find positions as they become available. Um, I think it is, it's, it's, it's challenging, right? It's not, it's not, um, in some cases, it's not as kind of a straightforward path as, you know, big law, for example, right, or, or some other law firm. I think um, in one piece of advice that I got early on in my career, which I found always, you know, very helpful was like, be bold, right, be bold early on. As, as law students, I think, you know, it's really easy to see the world as this kind of very small place with these very small possibilities and options. But it turns out after you graduate, it's actually a really big world, right? And there's a lot of things and there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of possibilities to explore. Um, so I would recommend, you know, uh, building relationships with folks in the field. You know, that includes kind of writing about these topics. That includes, um, you know, interning in, in places where it's possible. That includes applying for fellowships, applying for other kind of opportunities, uh, you know, for, for early entry uh, into the field. Um, and then just having the kind of resilience to manage the uncertainty, um, because um, it, it sometimes, um, yeah, it sometimes requires uh, being a little bit more open to uncertainty as you figure out what the next step might be. Yeah, and I would say similarly, I think if it's something that you're very intellectually curious about and you know become passionate about, um, a path hopefully opens up for you. Um, in my case, I was really curious and passionate about IP policy, but as I said before, my undergrad was not in a science field, so that cut me off from the patent bar and other things. Um, when I found out that competition policy was hugely important for IP, um, it, it, you know, going forward. Um, especially in the Obama administration where a lot of these problems were kind of highlighted and still important to stay. I, you know, I took every IP class, I took all the competition classes, and then my competition professor through one of my papers ended up introducing me to uh, some people in DC that are working on this stuff. And through there, I made the connections. And it is admittedly a, a hard area to break into at first, uh, especially if you don't have the right contacts or network, but I find that once you're here and you, um, you know, make a reputation for yourself, um, it's it's easy to to stick around because 
there's a lot of value in good advocates in the public interest, especially in complex topics. And so I highly recommend it. I find it both personally fulfilling and, you know, just um, a, a good line of work. Uh, well, you know, I think those are fantastic thoughts and particularly just on the, the role of kind of making connections with the folks at your law schools and also in the in the sort of community that works in this area. And so, you know, I'm pleased to have hopefully um, increased all of your connections by two more people um, who, you know, I've just had the, the, the real privilege of being able to work with over over the past years um, and that hopefully you'll be able to get in contact with. Um, so, you know, let's all, let's all thank Matt and Zane for a, for a wonderful presentation. Thanks for having us. All right. Yeah, thanks, thanks everybody. Sean. Did we both leave? I think so. I think so. <laughs> oh, let me stop the recording. <laughs>